Welcome back to the CreateX stage at COGEX Hybrid Festival 2021. Thank you for joining us. In case you have just tuned in, COGEX is a global leadership summit and festival of AI and transformational technology addressing the big question, how do we get the next 10 years right? I am Leila Siddiqui, Associate Director Diversity at the IPA and member of the Creative Industries Council Diversity Group, and I'm your MC this afternoon. CreateTech has put together a stellar lineup of cutting edge content from gaming, live performance, advertising, fashion, music, visual arts, and so much more over the last few days. It is worth reinstating that CreateTech is unique in that it is the intersection of creative and technology industries where innovation in AI, VR, algorithms, specialized softwares, and others are transforming creative services outputs and processes. Create Tech at COGEX 2021 is hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by associate partners, Digital Catapult, Facebook, Moore Kingston Smith, and UKRI. Please do join the conversation on social using hashtag createtechuk and hashtag COGEX 2021. You can find out more about the work of the Creative Industries Council at www.thecreativeindustries.co.uk. Applications are now also open for our annual showcase of the best innovations in UK Create Tech called Ones to Watch. We have come to our final session for Create Tech. The theme for the session is Cultural Pathways for the Next 10 Years. The digital world has played a major role in broadening the boundaries of what's considered art. Can technology also increase engagement, making audiences more diverse? Some very big questions here for our expert panelists who are at the forefront of culture and design. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Katie Wickramensinghe, founder of KTW London and The Wick, who is our moderator for this session. Katie has been recognized as a top five PR week power book luxury leader UK and is a leading voice working across the arts and business sectors. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you for the very kind introduction and hi everyone and welcome to the final sweltering talk on the Createx stage at this year's COGEX festival. We've seen some incredible panels already and hopefully this one will also impress. Um, but before we get to an incredible talent lineup, I, let me introduce myself. So I'm Katie Wickram Singh, the founder of KTW London and The Wick. We're a global communications consultancy and cultural content platform on a mission to connect the culturally curious and to make businesses more art engaged and responsible. So art and technology, they've long had a conversation and we're going to be talking today about new ways of seeing cultural pathways for the next 10 years. The title of this talk is a play on the seminal work by John Berger, whose book has had an enduring impact on how we view arts and culture. So in terms of arts and culture, they've always had a conversation, but the last couple of years has seen a seismic shift, which has been catapulted to the forefront with COVID-19. We've seen shifts not just in world themes and discourse around diversity, sustainability and transparency, but also the ways in which we create, connect, and communicate with art and culture. We saw the necessity of galleries, institutions, and theatres hit their audiences, and the need to go via home screens and via our phones, changing how, when, and what we engage with. We've seen exhibitions at MoMA going virtual. We've seen the launch of the first virtual museum, VOMA. There's obviously been the introduction of the infamous NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and the rise of immersive experiences such as Van Gogh Alive and Superblue. We've even seen the Royal Shakespeare Company partnering with gaming technologies to showcase their performances of dream. And of course, we've witnessed iconic legends and artists such as Hockney with his iPad exhibition at the Royal Academy, which is supported by global public installations and digital screenings. 
Not to mention that technology has also changed the modes and practices in the ways we actually create art itself. So I'm incredibly excited that we're joined by a brilliant group of innovators and cultural leaders today to discuss how these pathways are set to evolve and how our cultural future is being shaped. So thank you all so much for joining. And I just want to do a quick round of very impressive introductions. So we have first up British artist, Jonathan Yeo, one of the world's leading portrait artists known for his traditional and experimental portraiture. His sitters have ranged from David Attenborough, Malala, to Nicole Kidman, to Johnny Ive and the late Duke of Edinburgh. Johnny has appeared in various museums across the globe, including the Royal Academy, and he recently minted his first NFT on SuperRare. As well as this, he's a trustee of London's National Portrait Gallery, co-curator of Soho House Art Collection, and also won Artist of the Year with GQ for his creative innovations. Suhair Khan works with Google Strategy and has done for a very long time. Over the past decade, she's made pivotal projects um, and initiatives and partnerships with Google Arts and Culture and beyond. And last year, Suhair founded her own cultural platform, Open Ended Design, for conversations uniting design, tech and culture. As well as this, she's passionate about education and a visiting lecturer at the Architectural Association and Masters in Architecture programme at Central St Martins. We have Lord Ed Vasey, member of the House of Lords. Prior to this, he was the longest serving culture and digital minister that the UK government has seen from 2010 to 16. He was responsible for the rollout successfully of rural broadband to over 4 million homes and the introduction of 4G, as well as lots of other innovations that have seen our economy flourish with the creative industries. Ed was, the, was one of the only people to publish a white paper in culture, the first in 50 years, and serves on the board of Digital Theatre and is a trustee for the National Youth Theatre and patron for kids and museums. And last but by no means least, Tim Marlowe OBE, Chief Executive and Director of the Design Museum in London, formerly Artistic Director of the Royal Academy of Arts, Director of Exhibitions at YQ. Tim's been involved in the contemporary art world for over 30 years and is known as a curator, broadcaster and writer in addition. He sits on the Board of Trustees and Advisors for numerous organisations including the Imperial War Museum, Art on the Underground, Design Age Institute and Culture Shop Media. So guys, thank you so much for joining today. I'm really excited to have you all in the same room or screen of room. It's such a privilege. Um, and I think we're all so happy that you're able to give up very valuable time as clearly from your bios. You're incre incredibly busy people. Um, I wanted to start off, um, Ed, obviously as someone who's worked in, in leadership and policy making, we can't really talk about the next 10 years without thinking about the changes and the shifts that have recently occurred. So over COVID-19, what has been some of the most obvious shifts that you have seen from a cultural perspective? So I think um, for me, uh, I'm very interested in all the, the entire sort of digital space. I was both the Minister for Culture and the Minister for Technology. So I straddled these two worlds and I was always interested in the fact that they never seemed to meet and to be blunt i always found obviously the most interesting innovation happening in the world of technology now a lot of that can be kind of in some ways quite pedestrian you know how do you hail a taxi you can use a smartphone that has changed the way people do things but you might not say that's kind of uh the heart and soul of the arts but at least you would meet people in the world of technology who are constantly thinking how to do di things differently now that we all have these amazing devices in our hands and I think that what COVID has shown is it's sort of started a transformation, but I don't think we've quite got there yet. And I would put it into sort of three buckets, if I can use the privilege of going first to try and set the agenda, although given the quality of the other panellists, I may not succeed. The first is you take the physical thing, you take the performance or the museum and you put it online. You're closed during the pandemic, so many, many more uh, museums and performing arts organizations have leaned in to engaging with an audience online. And I can't remember, I think it was the Victoria and Albert, I, I, I won't name, but because I'll probably be getting wrong, but there was one museum that told me, you know, they'd done nothing. I think it was actually the National Gallery, they'd done nothing really online and they ended up doing 500 events online during the pandemic. So suddenly you get this incredible engagement 
and a discovery by these institutions that they can reach global audiences who have a thirst for engagement with them. So that's point one, straightforward, analog, online. Point two is what I call, is a terrible sort of cliche, Mozart with a synthesizer. You know, if Mozart had been alive in the 1980s, would he have composed using a synthesizer? And I put Johnny Yeo in that bucket. So Johnny is using new technology to create art uh, in new ways uh, and exciting, interesting and different ways. And I think that is a great thing. And Hockney is another example of just using an iPad. So artists embracing new technology, and that can also include performance and doing performance where you, uh, you, you curate the performance with an eye to a digital audience, not a physical audience. So that's point number two. The third thing, which I think is missing, is how do you engage an audience that a smartphone first that can both physically visit your uh, exhibition or your performance or want to engage with you online but how do you do that in a much much smarter way than what we've been doing during covid which is simply taking the analog experience and putting it online and i think that's the great unexplored opportunity which i want to lean into over the next year or so yeah, and I think there's been a fascinating movement as well, as you mentioned, in terms of content that's not just captured, but is actually potentially um, originated or innovated. And I know we've spoken about um, some of the projects I've worked on, like Marquee TV, where they actually co-commission their own content. And I wanted to ask you, obviously, um, from your position, you've obviously seen the importance of creativity to the economy, um, the value of that to effectively the bottom line, it's worth 11 billion to the UK alone. So in your view, um, what would be the most important thing for the UK government to focus on in the next 10 years in this space, if they had to pick one area, would it be around this Amazonization that you've talked about? Would it be around the, the co-creation? How, how would it link to the creative sector with technology? Well, I've started talking about the Amazon, Amazonization of culture in a slightly provocative way, but it's actually based on the fact that Doug Gurr, who came from Amazon, is now the chief executive of the Natural History Museum. Doug told me the other day that, um, you know, they're building a new research centre, funny enough, in my old constituency, Harwell, but they're putting TV studios in there to create content. And Doug's point is, you know, he's uh, our museum has about 100 million visitors, but we have data on about a million of them. We have about a thousand, the Natural History Museum has about a thousand pieces of content, but to really engage the breadth of people who will have different interests from the Natural History Museum, you probably need a hundred thousand pieces of content. And what I mean by Amazonization is not that you get ruled by an algorithm or that you're constantly uh, buying uh, branded goods from the museum. It's about the relentless engagement with an audience and experimenting about how you engage them and getting to know them and providing tailored content for them. And that's what I would lean into. I think uh, institutions have got the fact that they can engage with audiences with their physical content. I think artists are leaning into new technology. But what I don't think is institutions really understand and I, I say this in a sort of neutral way, the way that the platforms, the Amazons and so on, really know their customers and are constantly innovating to keep their customers engaged. Now, some people think that's a terrible thing. Yep. Personally, if, if the museum wanted to keep me engaged with different and new content, I would think that is a good thing. So that's what I mean by that phrase. Okay, thank you. And um, Johnny, I wanted to move over to yourself. So I'm very familiar with your practice over a long period of time. And I think what's really important to mention is as an artist that's actually creating firsthand, you always worked um, with technology. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit um, about a project that you did with the Royal Academy a little while back. Yes, um, actually, I think all the other panel members were, in, well, certainly Sue Aaron and Tim were closely involved with that. Um, the um, uh, and I've certainly discussed it with Ed a few times. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a painter by background, so my day job is, in a sense, a very traditional one. Um, and it kind of gives you, I think, in a way, it gives you a certain freedom because you kind of like to tick the box of kind of you know doing the um, uh, the sort of formal thing, 
And I've always found, I've always been very interested in, 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 in using technology. Um, but that was the first time it really was a, bit, a big part of an exhibition and a big part of something I'd done. So I basically, the nutshell of it, I got into 3D technology. Uh, and then at the same time, um, uh, some of Suez colleague, colleagues at Google showed me their um, VR creative software they were working on, uh, Tiltbush. And um, uh, I was ex experimenting with how to p bring these together and uh, create sculpture basically a portrait sculpture um using virtual technology essentially um and it was um and at the time i thought i've got to do this in a hurry because lots of other people are going to do it and i want to be the first um and i think sort of whatever it is three or four years later i don't know if anyone else has done it yet because it's still a little bit um uh complicated to do but i think we will see a lot more of that in the future um I was Sorry. going to say, without falling down the NFT hole, which I'm keen not to do, because I know there's been some fantastic COGX talks purely on that subject, but I know that you did recently launch a super rare NFT. Um, how did you find working in, in that platform, in the, in, in the way that um, digital technologies are, are coming to the fore? And I suppose the bigger question there is, do you think it has longevity and where, where do you see that going over the next 10 years? Uh, so. Yes, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, so we won't get into it other than to say, I think, I mean, at the moment, the NFTs are really more about the how, what happens to the artwork after you've created it than the artwork itself. Uh, so it's about you know, new ways you can um, uh, you know, sell, exhibit, own, um, and interact with, 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 with things. I think what's potentially exciting is that it enables um, uh, there to be a, a market for things and therefore artists can make a living uh, who up until really you know, only a few months ago uh, could only do if they were making a, 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 making something that was you know a commodity a physical commodity usually um, with the exception of performance pieces and monetary things like that but I think um, you know and by the way I think yeah performance pieces now may have a new lease of life because of this this, this thing I think I do think it has longevity. I don't know what form in. I'm not sure it'll be in the current form. Um, but I and I'm but I'm yeah. I'm not sure about I'm futurology is very good anyway. I was telling my friends last year who were telling me to hurry up and do NFTs. So I was like, oh, that's ten years away. You know, come back to me when it's about to happen. Um, but uh, I think the reason I think it's got longevity is that yeah, uh, it, you know, it'll, it'll it, it, this thing will be as bigger. It'll create it'll create a new genre. And that's yeah. really exciting for artists. And I think what, what needs to happen is that it needs the people who are making them, at the moment it's quite a narrow pool of people who are really you know, making use of them, who, who are already trained probably professionals um, uh, in the sort of VFX and um, graphic design world. Uh, and what we need is the artists who are perhaps you know, more used to kind of telling kind of complex stories and doing unexpected things. Um, uh, rather than for commercial projects, need to learn the tools to do it. And it, it's not that difficult. Um, it took me a few months to teach myself the basics of 3D engines. Uh, but, you know, it, there'll, there'll be a bit of a learning curve, I think, but it'll happen in the, in, within a few years. And I think also, Johnny, it's important to say congratulations because you were recently just nominated for a design award for your artist in studio app, which I want to come back to. But you mentioned here about tools and new generations of creatives. And Tim, I wanted to pass over to you um, from an institutional perspective. Obviously, you're highly committed to um, the education um, in terms of the creative sectors. And how have you been able to keep that continuum of all the great things that the design museum does um, over both lockdown and how do you which are the areas that you want to continue with as we come out of lockdown well lockdown is obviously a specific context in which you want to reach audiences because you're closed so you use ed's all the three of ed's buckets i have the third is the most interesting one which would be uh, uh, not at all around the electronic exhibition but bespoke content that's made only for people who can't go to the exhibition but have bought a ticket and can either go before or after so you play those buckets i mean I, i'm interested in hybridity and the problem about conversations like this not the one we're specifically having today but it's so absolutist it's either is it long is there a longevity is it going to replace something of course it isn't and the show that johnny referred to which i'm not going back to i'm just using it as a model for the future actually took the notion of the life class and then looked at different technologies exploring that from uh, uh, early um, anatomy sessions to drawing to painting to sculpture to new technology and what gets lost often is human content and wrestling with who we are and how we are on earth is 
perennial, universal. And there's just different technologies with whom interesting people, usually called artists and, and designers with slightly different purpose, how they use all that. So the gold rush a, 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 a mentality around, say, NFTs is kind of laughable, not because the technology is not interesting, not because there haven't been some interesting things done, and certainly not because there won't be brilliant things done in the future, but it's a race of market and some institutions somehow feeling if we're not there at the beginning, we're going to get left behind, which is a yeah. lie because early adoption means nothing in this business. It's simply how well we use it. And we're neither going to be rewarded or penalized if we don't jump on it immediately. We just look and use it well. We can be pioneering to a certain extent in the way that we um, we broker ideas and facilitate ideas. But I've always enjoyed in my professional life, although it's been institutional, um, working with creative people. The Royal Academy is an artist and architect founded institution. The Design Museum, you know, we exist fundamentally to promote design and work with the design communities. Mm -hmm. uh, Cube before when I was in the commercial sector was an artist-led gallery, it has to be. And, and actually, there are too many people in institutions deciding what they think policy should be, rather than actually trying to harness creative thinking, which is mm -hmm artists and designers do and work with it so in answer to your question which is long a long-winded answer i want to find a hybrid model in the future and i don't know what the next 10 years are going to be i've got an idea for the next two but i know it will be led by my conversations and engagements with people like Sahar, john uh, johnny and and others and ed of course i always love Ed, but in a different way but it, yeah. it will be about forging different ways of working with the different technologies to reach different audiences but I think also, as you mentioned, that speed of going in and out of this technological innovation is often based on resource, it's based on cost, and it's something that's often not spoken about um, on, on the institutional level, that there's a presumption that it's all going to um, sort of be in line. And I think what uh, you've done very cleverly is worked with some incredible collaborations and different cross um, interdisciplinary sectors in the creative industry. And I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit about a project that came about um, over um, recent times, which was... Uh, the supermarket. Well, I can't, and I'll tell you why it's interesting, that supermarket, because, so it was it was, it was, was for five days, it was always only going to be five days, it was predicated on a really visionary approach to the museum from what was eventually called the sponsor, Bombay Sapphire, let's hear it from our sponsor, who said, look, we want to do this supermarket. We would have sponsored this talk, Tim, we would have gotten to sponsor the talk, it would have been... No, I, I couldn't mention it. Been <laughs> I couldn't mention their names on the BBC. When the BBC and ITV came to talk about it, I couldn't mention the sponsors. And they came with an idea about us. Uh, uh, they said, we've got this idea about creating a business you know, Everywhere else is, museums have to stay closed. Companies can open up what's essential. But then we moved it towards, let's get emerging designers to do the packaging. Uh, Michaela Yarwood Dan, bog roll. It all began, the lockdown, people stockpiling this stuff. It ended with people stockpiling this. It was the same price as a normal loo roll, but it happened to be one of a thousand editions. And we turned the museum shop into a full installation because Camille Wallala did the, did, did, did a whole makeover rather than just shop front dressing. So you went from a shop that was an installation that was a shop again, that sold this, that raised revenue for an emerging designers fund. And people piled down to it. And my other it is from that also we use digital media we use, this was a new entrepreneurial way of working to a certain extent but it also reframed you know diff different approaches to institutions and, and installation but the physical experience of people coming down to acquire physical things with some online as well is that hybrid model that i keep talking about because people after lockdown but even pre-lockdown museum among other things sports stadium shops but people want to be communal. They want to share things some of the time at least. And that and if museums stand for anything, it's about this physical, you know, experience of, of, of shared space and, and coming together to look or experience things in, in, in different ways. And the digital can amplify that, it can take you in different areas, it can it can give you a different experience. But you can't get away from the physical experience, I think. Thank you. And I think I'm going to come back um, to local and global because I know you've done some incredible projects recently with Abu Dhabi as well. But I want to head on over to Zahair Khan, who's waiting patiently um, in our room. Um, so, Zahair, you have worked on some of the most incredible collaborations, as Tim mentioned, of disciplines coming together. And there are a couple that I wanted to touch on. I wonder if you could talk about because I know a few people who I discussed this talk with were um, wanted to understand more around um, the Google mission behind arts and culture and that direct work that maybe people might not be aware of directly with institutions. So I wonder if you could tell us 
about Feed the Lions and also um, the importance of, of that dialogue um, with things like the Serpentine that you've been working on the last few years. Yeah, sure. So um, just an intro on Google Arts and Culture, which Ed has probably heard me say this about 5,000 times now. So um, we work with 2,000 cultural institutions around the world, and we were founded as a platform in 2011. So it's been a long time by Google standards. Um, the original mission was to showcase culture from all over the world in a way that is free, accessible, and fun, uh, really building off of Google's mission uh, of making the world's information easily accessible for anyone, anywhere. And we started off as a Google project, so working purely with Art Museum. Uh, we launched with about 17, uh, the Met, the MoMA, the Tate. And uh, we help to digitize art collections. We take high resolution photography of important artworks. Uh, we do photogrammetry, things like bog roll in 3D online, Johnny's head <laughs> in 3D <laughs> scan. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and also Google Street View, so you can walk up and down the halls of the Met or the Tate or the Prado or, uh, you know, museum, you know, anywhere in the world now, uh, and important archaeological sites. So the mission has expanded and, and the focus has expanded from to cultures defined more broadly. So not every country has art or art museums uh, as part of its own heritage. So we look at everything from the documentation of fashion uh, to sports, to intangible heritage, food, uh, you know, something like sneakers uh, would be an amazing story for our platform. And I think as all well with this sort of of thinking about what makes culture accessible. And I think that is really the point of a little bit of this conversation. At the end of the day, I don't believe either that technology can ever replace a physical experience. We all know that being online doesn't replace community or all of us uh, being together and, and everything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, in terms of um, transcending boundaries, you're working on something really exciting linked to language at the moment. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that project. Yeah, so a lot of what we do, the final part of our work is bringing technologies like machine learning, immersive reality, uh, you know, Johnny talked a bit about VR, to the work of Artists, artists, designers, and for me, that's actually probably now increasingly the most powerful part of our work is that interdisciplinary collaboration because a lot of institutions are beginning to digitize their own collections and tell their own stories if they have the budget to do so. But where mm -hmm. there is this gap still is the walls between culture and tech. And so there's tons of initiatives that are ongoing. Uh, you mentioned Feed the Lions, which I can talk about later. Uh, but there is this new app that's just been launched. It's called Wula and it's been run by an artist at, on the Google Arts and Culture team whose mission is preserving heritage at risk. Uh, so anything from... Yeah, sorry, uh, you know, the name, repeating the name of the platform. The irony is not lost yes. that you're not going to get cut out as you said the name of the language. Oh, I'm sorry. It is called Wularu. Um, and I will type it up for you later. W-O-O. Uh, especially in indigenous uh, Australia-based language that's now at... It's now actually... A, considered to be a lost language. So on this app, it actually uses machine learning. So you can take a picture of a t-shirt or a coffee cup or uh, I don't know, a uh, postcard, and it will give you a word that describes that object using visual recognition in that language. And I think there's about 12 languages on that app now, including Rapa Nui, uh, Yiddish, uh, and, and more. Uh, and the idea is how do you use technology in a fun and playful and thoughtful way to unpack culture uh, in unexpected ways? And those yeah. ideas and those collaborations come about because we're working with curators at a museum or with an artist like Johnny, and not because we're sitting within our four walls as technologists thinking about how technology can change the world. And I think, Suhair, I'm going to come back to you. You've also created your own platform, which I want to hear about open-ended. But Ed, you've also been creative in um, lockdown um, what was uh, you've been working on a uh, creative podcast actually working directly with cultural creators how have you seen um, dialogue shifting through through those projects that you're working on so I've done a podcast of a cultural podcast where we literally had to scrape the bottom of the barrel we got Johnny Yeo on we were so desperate uh, for the podcast, although uh, we haven't had Tim on <laughs> yet, so we better get them on as well. Uh, it's been great fun actually connecting people. But, I mean, I don't ever do podcasts. I mean, I think 
There are sort of two million podcasts oh, created every, uh, two million podcasts created every day. But um, uh, I would just like to go back to what Tim and Kay were talking about, which is about my third bucket, which is the audience engagement and tech. I mean, I think there's just a whole uh, landscape of technology that the arts haven't yet explored. That some of it is really boring, like blockchain technology to take account, you know, to archive your objects. I mean, the VNA were telling me today when I met them that uh, they discovered a carpet that was um, lost in 1952. <laughs> I forced the VNA to move out of their storeroom in Hammersmith and they unwrapped this carpet and found this other carpet wrapped inside, which they haven't seen for 70 years. Now, I'm not saying the blockchain will stop people wrapping up an old carpet in another old carpet, but there's a lot of boring technology. But going back to you know, the electronic uh, dance exhibit, which I saw at the Design Museum, I'm talking about not just content for people who can't get to it, but I'm talking about, again, that, that boring thing of, you know, now I've got this object, I can have the taxi differently. But also, I want to tour my exhibition differently. What, what are the technologies that we can find uh, that will be integral to that? And uh, also, knowing your audience, you know, the, the fact that everyone now has to register just to visit a museum is weirdly, paradoxically, quite good news for museums because you're going to know much, much more about the people who come and visit, even if it's a right royal pain in the backside for people who pop into a design museum every other morning, like me. So hey, Johnny and Tim, I wanted to ask you about, your, about that audience capture and um, relationship management and how that can shift with technology as well um, and whether you whether you think that has um, improved over you know Johnny you were doing portraits on iPads with your sitters you've created the app to go into the studio how, how has that affected those relationships in a human form um, so yeah I mean I think it doesn't replace human contact um, but it is an interesting uh, way of doing things where you, you, you learn from and it's lovely to in, 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 engage a big audience which I think it did more than anything else we've done which is you know, a ridiculously sort of um lo-fi way of producing something from home with a few cameras and ipads um but it is very interesting and i think this is where it goes and i mean we, you know, another time we may have time to talk about metaverses and things like that i'm dying to pick up tim on something he said which interested me which i can't believe we've never talked about before when you just said about the museums being this sort of like you know more about the experience than um and, and the kind of like you know i think this is the gist of it was you know um uh, it's group activities you know shared experiences and that sort of thing which are going to be a bigger thing which i totally agree with but my so th thinking of the long term i i have the strong suspicion that we're going to become this we're gradually becoming less attached to physical things you know and, and lots of technologies that are coming along i think are going to accelerate that and that you know, you know is a potential problem for me as an artist yeah. and for yeah. the commercial part of the art world but i think also there's an interesting question for museums it's like will people be not no longer coming to look at great artifacts from the past and worship the, the presence of the religious relic or you know, um, you know that that aspect of it witnessing the actual object and will it shift permanently to something else will that never will that never leave it won't go because human beings have that compulsion the relic uh the notion that other human beings have shared that space but it's i'm not arguing against the importance of technology or the fact that there will be paradigmatic shifts and i think Sahar's point about archiving heritage at risk and so on is critical so actually in the notion of the preservation of culture or this is how something was but actually this is how it is now it's another brilliant hybrid so we know all objects in the end go to dust um, and we've spent a lot of time trying to preserve objects as we should do but it's, it will be fascinating in 200 years time to see the kind of digital scanning and the digital technology that will show us leonardo's version of the rocks now and what it looks like in 200 years time so the archiving and preservation in that way is critical but the interesting thing is will the art or the cultural world Will it revert to bad habits in spite of saying it wants to be more sustainable and do less? I suspect it will, but I hope not. And that idea that we become more localized and that we disseminate a lot of what we do nationally and internationally through technology is really important. So we don't all have to move around the world like a circus, which is what the art world does and the architecture world to some extent. We can actually do a, a lot more responsibly from one particular place. But in some ways that makes the bringing together of artifacts or exhibitions more important when it happens it's just that we shouldn't be doing 18 exhibitions a year as one major institution is doing in london we should probably be doing three 
uh, and, 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 and making them more event driven and using the technology. These three buckets, by the way, are going to live with me for the next year uh, in, though, in, in, in different ways to disseminate and share. That's the key. Yeah. And so it sounds like have the three oh, have the three buckets landed with you, Tim? Have I penetrated? Have I penetrated no. your consciousness? Three buckets. Three buckets. Have this entire conversation. You've been so yeah. bothered. And <laughs> every <everyone, laughs> <in a bucket. laughs> question. <laughs> so, so here and legacy and how we're protecting history with technological innovation. You're doing that in spades in your work at Google, something to, you know, in terms of historical sites, could you talk to us, uh, just, I want to wrap on the importance of historical sites, physical connections, and there's something, some really important work you're doing there um, in terms of SciArc. Yes, uh, so we, you know, we're documenting, I mean, it's just an extension of what I said and what, what Tim touched on. I mean, I just wanted to also end on maybe as a Googler, uh, the future facing part of this, there is a documentation in the archiving element, but there's also creativity. And I think uh, in terms of what happens in the art world, I agree, there's a lot of noise and buzz around NFTs and, and whatever else right now. But I think increasingly, we just need to accept that technology will be a tool that will allow for uh, in different ways and new directions. It won't replace, often it'll be supplemental, but it should be seen more as a tool uh, than as a replacement. And that's how cultural institutions should be empowered to engage with it. Um, you know, these museums, the, the big ones have been safeguarding culture for hundreds of years. And I think that we also need to keep our doors and our minds open for seeing where there's innovation, where there's room for collaboration, particularly as we think of attention spans shifting, young people engaging with culture in new ways and feeling comfortable in accessing art and culture, maybe in ways that would not have been what we would have expected, uh, but allow for them to engage uh, in new and different ways uh, and to be flexible. And I think artists like Johnny have been amazing at being open to those possibilities and not being afraid to fail uh, because at the end of the day as technologists for us experimentation is how we work um, and things breaking and not working is you know much more acceptable than traditionally has been in the cultural space and i think we need to keep that in mind i think that's a really I, I, uh, oh i was just going to say johnny one last point and then we've got a wrap oh well i'm afraid i'm just going to say that i mean never mind about using the blockchain it, it, my takeaway from this is if you really want to pr preserve works for the future you wrap them inside a carpet and give it to the VNA. <laughs> <laughs> so a great place to wrap. And I think it's been fantastic having all of your different viewpoints, all of your ways of seeing. As someone who works in industry and um, on cross collaborations, it's such a privilege to have you all here. And I know that the audience would have loved this conversation. So thank you all and good luck with all your respective projects. And I'm gonna hand back over to Leila. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Katie. That was brilliantly moderated. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lord Vasey, Sohir, Jonathan, for such a fantastic session covering such a diverse range of content, which beautifully highlights interdisciplinary collaboration and the role of technology within that.